This video was brought to you by Imprint. For the past few years, Armenia and Azerbaijan have been fighting over a disputed bit of land called Nagorno-Karabakh. As the larger and wealthier country, Azerbaijan has always had the upper hand in these disputes. But with Armenia's main security partner, Russia, busy in Ukraine, Azerbaijan has really started tightening the screws recently. Since about 2021, Azeri forces have been engaging in regular skirmishes along the Azerbaijan-Armenia border. And late last year, they cut off the main road into Nagorno-Karabakh, essentially sieging the territory. And in order to end this siege, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan even apparently floated giving up Nagorno-Karabakh during EU-mediated talks back in March. But negotiations were ultimately unsuccessful. With little incentive to continue negotiations then, last week Azerbaijan started deploying troops around Nagorno-Karabakh, and on Tuesday morning, Azeri forces started shelling the territory, with the Azerbaijan foreign minister announcing that it was the beginning of a quote, anti-terrorist operation. So in this video, we're going to take a look at why the two countries are even fighting, what happened early this week, and why Azerbaijan will probably end up regaining control of Nagorno-Karabakh. Just quickly, we announced recently that we're making a physical TLDR newspaper. So if you want to learn more or order this pretty silly one-off collector's item, then there's a link to the announcement video and the store in the description. Pre-orders close October 1st. So let's get straight into it. On Tuesday morning at about 11 a.m., Azerbaijan announced that they were performing what they described as a local anti-terrorist operation and were sending its troops into the disputed region that Azerbaijan calls Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia calls Artsakh. For context, since the collapse of the Russian Empire at the beginning of the 20th century, Armenia and Azerbaijan have argued over this territory, which sits inside Azerbaijan but is mostly populated by ethnic Armenians. Now, there was a brief war over the area, which was essentially won by Armenia, who kicked out the Azeris and set up an autonomous administration called the Republic of Artsakh. In theory, the Republic of Artsakh was designed to be independent from Armenia, but in practice, it's very much aligned with the Armenian government. Despite the fact that Armenia de facto controls the territory, the vast majority of the international community and the UN consider Nagorno-Karabakh to still be part of Azerbaijan. Anyway, this recent so-called anti-terrorist operation began a day after two Azeri civilians and seven soldiers were allegedly killed by landmines planted by Armenian militants on the Fazuli Shusha Highway, with the Azerbaijani foreign ministry even citing this bombing in the announcement of their anti-terror operation. But while these attacks might be the proximate cause, this invasion has been a long time coming. For the past few years or so, Azerbaijan has been trying to pressure Armenia into giving up Nagorno-Karabakh. This began in earnest in 2020, when Azerbaijan invaded Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia proper. In this instance, Armenia was only saved by a last-minute intervention from Russia, but when it became clear that Russia was preoccupied in Ukraine and neither had the political will nor military capacity to protect Armenia, Azerbaijan restarted its pressure campaign. Now, this started small with the occasional border skirmish, with Azeri troops occupying little bits of land in Armenia proper. But by the end of last year, Azeri troops blocked the main road connecting Armenia to Nagorno-Karabakh, essentially amounting to a siege of Nagorno-Karabakh and the 100,000 or so Armenians living in the territory, who have since complained about food, fuel and medicine shortages. Then, a couple of days ago, thousands of Azeri troops were deployed around Nagorno-Karabakh, sparking some anxiety about the prospect of a full-on invasion. And, well, on Tuesday, that's exactly what happened. Now, when it comes to the exact details, it's hard to see exactly what's going on here. But at the time of writing, it looks like Azerbaijan is shelling cities across the region, including the capital. And this is pretty terrible news for Armenia, because, well, there's nothing they can really do about it. Azerbaijan is a bigger country with a bigger economy and bigger army. And Armenia doesn't have any reliable security partners now that Russia has essentially withdrawn. For context, Azerbaijan has a population nearly four times bigger than Armenia's, a GDP about three times as big, and a military budget five times as big. 
This is probably why, a couple of hours after the invasion began, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan announced that the Armenian army wouldn't intervene in Nagorno-Karabakh, which in practice basically means giving up the territory to Azerbaijan. This shouldn't come as a total surprise either, because during EU-mediated negotiations in May, Pashinyan suggested that he be willing to give up Nagorno-Karabakh if Azerbaijan weakened their demands regarding the Zangizur Corridor. But negotiations ultimately collapsed, because Azerbaijan didn't feel like they needed to make any concessions. Now, that being said, Armenia hasn't totally given up, with their foreign ministry calling on Russian peacekeepers in the area to protect the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. But this seems unlikely, and an Armenian newspaper even claimed that Russian peacekeepers had started cooperating with Azeri troops. Then on Wednesday, Turkish media reported that Armenian militants in Nagorno-Karabakh had agreed to stand down and withdraw all heavy weaponry, essentially surrendering. So what happens next? Well, it looks overwhelmingly like Nagorno-Karabakh is going to end up back in Azerbaijan's hands. But the big question is whether this happens peacefully or violently. If the Armenian militants don't change their mind and Pashinyan resist the political pressure to intervene, then Azerbaijan might be able to take control of Nagorno-Karabakh with little bloodshed. However, if Pashinyan is pressured into intervening, or conflict breaks out over Azerbaijan's as yet unfinalized plans to deport Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh, then it could become depressingly bloody. Azeri and Armenians really don't get on. So if conflict were to break out, it could quickly spiral into a full-on war fueled by ethnic sentiments. Ultimately though, this is a diplomatic failure for the EU, US and Turkey, who all tried and failed to negotiate a settlement. But it's particularly embarrassing for Russia. The fact that Russia has proven to be a wholly unreliable security partner will force Armenia to seek alternative security arrangements from the West and possibly make other CSTO members think twice about relying too heavily on Russia for support. For context, the CSTO, or Collective Security Treaty Organization, is a Russian-led organization with a collective defense clause that includes a whole load of Central Asian countries. In fact, scared by their experience in Azerbaijan, Armenia has already started looking elsewhere for security guarantees. In just the last few weeks, Armenia has renounced its strategic reliance on Russia as a, quote, mistake sent arms to Ukraine, and announced a joint military exercise with the US. In a sense, what's happened in Nagorno-Karabakh might even make it easier for Armenia to cozy up to the West. Because the West never recognized their claim to Nagorno-Karabakh in the first place, and is one of the reasons why Western countries have been so reluctant to support Armenia too strongly, for fear of looking hypocritical vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine where the West is justifying its support as a defense of international norms and internationally recognized borders. You get the idea then. The events in Nagorno-Karabakh has undermined Russia's credibility as a security partner. And it'll be interesting to see how other CSTO members respond in the future. If you're interested in this kind of thing, you might enjoy Imprint's visual guide to the 48 Rules of Power, a book that's been described as an amoral, ruthless, and instructive guide for those interested in understanding and gaining power. But that's not the only thing you can learn. Just like TLDR, Imprint is all about helping you learn quickly, conveniently, and visually. It's super quick because most of their lessons take less than two minutes to complete, summarizing knowledge from all kinds of topics and using Harvard professors and best-selling authors to teach you key concepts. It's convenient because it's all housed in their easy-to-use mobile app, letting you replace doom scrolling with actual learning. And it's visual because, well, look at it. Their animated explanations help you stay focused, understand concepts quickly, and actually retain what you learn. So join the millions of users learning with Imprint, including me. I'm taking their multi-day flow course right now. And do that by using the link in the description. Plus, if you use that link, you'll get a seven-day free trial and get 20% off an annual plan when you sign up. And they'll know that you came from us. So check out Imprint, support our new sponsor, and thanks for watching TLDR.